the early morning of July 2nd, 1937. Amelia Earhart and her navigator are bound westward over the lonely mid-Pacific. It is the final leg of a grueling round-the-world flight. Within several hours, they will disappear. Dear Ms. Earhart, every day I take my National Geographic map down and look over those South Sea Islands, hoping that I can find the one where Miss Earhart goes and tell you so you can go and bring her home. Gosh, it's it's now 80, you know, 82 years later, and not a shred of evidence, in spite of the fact that a lot of people have looked. Mr. President, Mrs. Hoover, members and friends of the National Geographic Society. It's like an amazing series finale that just never got written. Amelia Earhart is the first woman to fly alone across the Atlantic and the only person who has twice crossed the ocean in an airplane. It's like the biggest cliffhanger ever. You have this amazing 39-year-old life that was like super incredible and broke all these records and boundaries and all this stuff, and that's not even the juiciest point of the story. The juiciest point is what happens after. I am deeply grateful. I have no words in which to express my appreciation. She says her last word is wait, and that's the last word we ever hear from her, and that's it. I think the fact that she was lost at sea makes uh, just lives on in the public imagination. Well, let me ask you this. If she hadn't disappeared, would you be here? Would the world turn out? This mystery makes people crazy. I'm probably the worst example myself. <laughs> but it's, it's a disease. Amelia fever? Amelia fever, yeah, yeah. You know, I think there's a certain fame thing. I'm the person that solved this big mystery. I mean, this is the biggest American woman's mystery, but it's also the biggest aviation mystery. So if you can solve it, you're somebody. You know, that's one of the things. You, you seek the truth. Whether you actually ever find it or not, that's part of life. And one's life is such a rich thing. There is so much to it. And it is so sad to think of it all being lost. It's the quest. And we are all on these epic journeys in search of something. Okay, are we ready to roll? Ready? There's nothing out here at all as far as the eyes can see. But there it is, Land Ho! Whoa, we're here. This is what you can't explain to people about the island. You know, the, the, the quote-unquote tropical sounds, the, how lush it is, and you just look around and it's a wonderland. How often do you get this opportunity? So ready. So ready. So, so ready. <laughs> oh my gosh. Everybody ready? Good evening and welcome to National Geographic, especially on a really difficult evening to get here, I hear. Traffic is, is uh, uh, the Christmas tree lighting, did anybody have trouble with that? But we're really glad you're here. My name is Peter Gwynn, I'm a writer and editor and the host of National Geographic's podcast, Overheard. Anybody, any subscribers, any listeners to the podcast? That's good, that's good, thank you. This is a really weird experience because usually I'm in a tiny little box in my pajamas recording this, so this feels really, really different. But we're really glad that you're here tonight, and we wanted to do something a little bit different. If you've listened to the podcast, you kind of know the format that we follow, but tonight we want to do something a little bit different, and we want to take you into the journey um, to find Amelia Earhart. 
This is such an enduring mystery in our culture. She's such an enduring figure, such a, an iconic figure who means a lot of things to a lot of people. And this summer, some of you may have heard that National Geographic mounted an expedition to go into the South Seas of the Pacific and, and execute a real archaeological search for potentially where she may have ended up. And some of you may have even seen that National Geographic, we did a, a documentary, the, the, the channel released a documentary called Expedition Amelia. And we kind of tagged along on that. We had, had uh, all kinds of people from, from here that went and looked at it from all kinds of angles. And it's a story that we just can't get out of our heads. I mean, this is an 82-year-old mystery um, that people are still obsessed with, but for different reasons. Some are obsessed with, you know, what happened, and others are obsessed with, with other things. And we're going to talk about some of those tonight. We're going to explore some of the deeper questions. So just to review um, the details of Amelia's disappearance, I want to kind of set the scene. I mean, some of you may know more than others, but just so we're all kind of on the same page. Amelia was flying her Lockheed Electra 10E from Leigh, New Guinea to Howland Island. And this is a tiny little speck of an island in one of the most remote parts of the Pacific. And this was the hardest part of this around-the-world journey that she was making. And what made this particularly hard is the fact that, you know, remember, this is the days before GPS. And, she, and her navigator, Fred Noonan, is using a combination of dead reckoning and celestial navigation. And this is basically the same kind of navigation that, you know, Columbus and ship captains are using, right? But he's using this up in the air. And what that means is, is that you're constantly having to monitor your compass heading, your airspeed, and the angle of the sun. And if you get off just a tiny little bit over the vast distances that you're covering in the Pacific, it means you miss your target by a lot. And their target is really tiny. So we have um, a Coast Guard ship was actually waiting off the coast of Howland Island. It's called the Itasca. And they're listening uh, to the radio channels that Amelia's using and anticipating her arrival. And they pick up a signal from her where they hear her voice on the radio saying, we must be on you, but we cannot see you. Gas is running low been unable to reach you by radio, we are flying at an altitude of 1,000 feet. And so the signal is so strong that the radio man runs out onto the deck of the ship, looking up in the air, thinking he's going to see the plane. But he can't see her. So the last transmissions that we have from her suggest that she was flying north-south along a line of position 157337. And we'll get into some of the significance of that in, in, in a little bit here. Now, the simple answer to this mystery is that she just ran out of gas and crashed into the ocean. And, you know, it's a huge ocean, it's super deep, and we'll never find her. But there's another theory, there's many, many theories, but one theory, and the theory that National Geographic was pursuing this past summer, is that she actually made it to this tiny little atoll, right? A tiny little five-mile square island called Nicomaroro. And so that's where we're going to take you tonight, is on this journey to Nicomaroro. Now, any big National Geographic search begins with the guy that I call the Indiana Jones at National Geographic. If any of you have watched an archaeological program on, on Nat Geo channel, read about it in the National Geographic magazine, or been over to the uh, museum across the courtyard and seen one of our many archaeological exhibits, you've seen the fingerprints of Fred Hebert. He is our archaeologist in residence. And Fred is the perfect guy to kind of talk to us about what it takes to, to go into this world. So please welcome Fred Hebert. I tried to get him to play the, uh, the Indiana Jones theme music when he came out, but no go, no go. All right, so Fred, 
Before we get into some of the nitty gritty here, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the special connection that National Geographic has with Amelia Earhart. She's just not some remote figure out there that we're sort of, I mean, she has a direct connection to us. Can you talk about that a little bit? Peter, she sure does. Uh, she was an amazing uh, female aviator in the 1930s when aviation was just at its beginnings. Uh, she broke all the barriers, gender barriers, altitude barriers. She went the longest distance. She, she flew across the Atlantic solo and was met back here in New York with a ticker tape parade. Well, in 1929, National Geographic Society gave her its most important award, its gold medal. And uh, she is really part of our DNA. She's an inspiration at that time for young women to go break any barrier. And even today, but you know, she is missing. It's, it's part of our DNA to help resolve that story. Uh, just an impossible task when you think about the search area that we have to look at. And, okay, so I know you have kind of an interesting anecdote about when you heard that National Geographic was going to, was, was thinking about this, about, about an expedition like this. Yeah, no, I was thinking about it for a couple of years before we could actually come to that extraordinary solution, how to come up with that extraordinary tool to resolve this. Thinking about Amelia Earhart, I was actually out in the field in Egypt looking at the Great Pyramids with the director of the pyramids and uh, talking about various, you know, incredible stories for National Geographic. And all of a sudden the director turns to me and says, Fred, what about Amelia? I mean, and it's at that time I realized uh, this is not just an iconic story for National Geographic. This is iconic for the world. It's a, it's a universal story. And shortly after that, it became clear that there was a solution. There was a solution which was part of the revolution in science that ancient DNA is. Okay. Ancient DNA can help find an individual. It's just a matter of, like, how do you find the DNA? Okay. All right. So how do you find DNA? Yeah. I mean, it's, we're talking about a giant ocean. Yeah. And, yeah, and, so. and you're also talking about 82-year-old ancient DNA that's degrading, and uh, the clock is ticking at us, and so we needed something that was going to help work quick. Well, the solution sort of came from a very unusual source. Bone-sniffing forensic dogs can help us find ancient DNA. This. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. So just so I got this right, so we, we know about this island, Nekamarora, and that's a place people know about, right? That's right. That's this theory that she's there. That's okay. And you're thinking that we can take bone-sniffing dogs to find, you know, any possible remains 82 years later. And if you get a hold of some of those, you could determine whether through DNA those, those are actually Amelia Hart, right? Well, yeah, I mean, right. and it was a race against the clock because I really didn't want the stuff to, to degrade to the point where it would remain a mystery forever. So I think you're a little behind the curve on the clock thing. Uh, well, but point taken, point taken. Sooner's better than later. All right, so here's my question. So how do you, how do you, how do you convince National Geographic to send bone-sniffing dogs to the... This is actually Fred's superpower. I'm setting him up here. <laughs> Fred's superpower is, is convincing people of all kinds of crazy things. So tell me how you, how you convinced them of this particular project that you... You were going to do this. Well, you have to do a proposal, right? A scientific proposal. Here's how you're going to do it. Here's when we want to do it. Here's how much it costs. And then I got a call from, you know, the, the president's office saying, uh, what's the deal about these business class airplane tickets for forensic dogs? Wait a minute, um, wait a minute, wait a minute. The dogs are flying business class? Yeah, these are super specialized um, tools. Okay, I don't fly way. business. I don't know hey, anybody that flies business. You class. know, it was sort of that um, you know extraordinary tool to solve a, an extraordinary problem, and and uh, yeah, that was that was part of the deal, right? You got to take the dogs plus their handlers, not only across the Pacific on business class, but also put them on a big cruise ship and take them out to the middle of the South Pacific. And uh, I, I don't think I've ever lived down putting that proposal up through the system here. Uh, <laughs> but he got it through. But he got it through. Let's be clear. Let's All right, so you've got bone snip. <laughs> Thank you, National Geographic.
All right, so we've got bone-sniffing dogs on the one side, but there's another secret weapon that we're bringing to this search. And what is that? Yeah, well, Peter, imagine that if we're actually getting close to finding the remnant DNA of Amelia Earhart, somewhere nearby is the airplane. Now, we at National Geographic have perhaps the world's greatest underwater finder, Robert Ballard. You know, remember he found the Titanic? The Woo! Titanic, I mean. I mean, really. It doesn't get almost any more iconic than finding the, the Titanic, right? Honestly, I wouldn't trust anybody else to say, like, if he can find the Titanic, he can find a lost airplane nearby where we're searching. And it happened to be that he was on putting together a cruise across the Pacific. So putting the spotlight of National Geographic together with the spotlight of Bob Ballard, we said, let's go. Okay, all right. Well, we've got our, our team in place. We're ready to go. Thank you very much for setting all that up for us. We're going to come back to Fred in just a little bit. But beforehand, we're going to talk about... Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. Fred, Fred Hebert, Indiana Jones of National Geographic. We're not used to the clapping. That doesn't happen in podcast land, but it's awesome. It's really good. Thank you. So, okay, but before we go to the South Pacific, we want to dive in a little more into who Amelia is and what she means to all of us, right? I mean, her picture, just seeing you know, the classic pictures that we've been seeing, she, you know, she, she speaks to us in a lot of different ways. The spirit of adventure, you know, female pioneer, you know, all the sort of the best things that we like to think about, about America, right? Um, and there's a whole subculture or a series of sub, subcultures that have kind of grown up around this person. And we wanted to look at what inspires people 80 years later. And so, to do that, um, you got to go to Atchison, Kansas. And so listen to this. So where are we right now? We are on the walking mall of Atchison, and uh, we're at the Amelia Earhart Festival, looking for the birthday cake and the card signing. There's lots of booths with Maple syrup, beef. Amelia Earhart Festival 2019, celebrating 23 years. So good to have all of you here tonight. So good to talk to you. Someone interviewed people in Atchison about, do you want them to find her or not? And a good number of them said, you know, part of what maintains everyone's interest and, and keeps people coming to Atchison is the mystery. I always say I hope they never find her. You know, each individual can write the end of the story the way they want. I don't want them to find her. And uh, I think that's part of the attraction as well. So tell me a little bit about the people who show up to the Amelia Festival. <laughs> the way that it works, it is the ability of an individual to transcend three dimensions. Well, there's lots of different people. Just incredible. What do you think happened? I, I lie on the side of I think she survived World War II. She may have assumed the identity of a lady named Irene Bolum. We think that may have been Amelia's daughter. They probably arrived by spaceship, dear. <laughs> the one thing I've learned more than anything else is they don't want to be wrong. It's an obsession for them, so yeah, it's kind of crazy. Uh, she is one of my obsessions, but I have I have many others. Trust me. Hatchison, Kansas, Amelia Earhart Festival. 2019 in the books. Are you guys fans of Amelia? Of course we are. What an amazing performance. Okay, so please welcome Amy Briggs. Amy Briggs. <laughs> Hi, Peter. <laughs> the clap is good, right? <laughs> yeah. So, Amy is the editor of National Geographic's History Magazine, and she has been on the Amelia Beat for years, looking at this in many ways, right, in all its manifestations, right? Mm -hmm. So you went to Atchison, Kansas. I sure did. What's in Atchison, Kansas? The birthplace of Amelia Earhart. Okay. But it is also ground zero for Amelia fandom. 
So every summer around Amelia's birthday, which is July 24th, they have the Amelia Earhart Festival, which is this multi-day thing. And it is like a little slice of Americana. So they all not only have like lectures about Amelia and book, talk, book talks about Amelia, but they also have a midway and carnival rides. And there's a big air show at the end of the, at the, end of the thing to close it all out with big fireworks too. Um, but yeah. Sounds you know, fun. It, it, Sounds it's great. It's totally fun, but there's kind of an edge to it too. Oh, wow. That makes it even better. Then. Okay. <laughs> so who do you meet? Who comes to the Amelia Earhart Festival in Atchison, Kansas? There are people who are passionate about Amelia Earhart, but this woman they've never met, but they are really, really into her. And the thing is that we were going around and meeting them and talking to them, and it seemed that they sort of fall into several different categories. Okay. You know, but m most of them are, they're there either to celebrate her and her life and her legacy. You know, she was, I think, the 16th woman to get a pilot's license in the United States. Wait, 16th woman ever? Ever. Okay. Ever. And, you know, all of the, the record-setting things that she did that was unprecedented right. for women at the right. time. Right, right. But then you also have people who are really into her death, into the, the mystery and the disappearance. Okay, so I have this picture in my head of like all these Amelia Earhart lookalikes kind of wandering through the streets <laughs> eating funnel cake. Is that, is that kind of the scene there? I mean, it sounds kind of, it sounds great. It sounds really interesting. It's great. There, there aren't as many um, Amelia cosplayers as you might imagine. Okay, um, right. There were, there were a few people who were dressed up as more like historical interpreters and reenactors. Okay. You know, who right. had the jodhpurs and the leather jacket and everything. Right, right. But they were actually performing and paid to be there to do so. I got you. Um, okay. But. Um, so let's go talk about the, um, the people in the in the theories. Let's let's talk about them a little bit. Okay. Who else is there? There are there's a broad range of Amelia subcultures. There right. the most widely accepted theories are of her disappearance are what you referred to earlier earlier, Crash and Sank, the castaway theory, which is what National Geographic explored, and there's also the or sorry, the castaway theory, I said that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then Japanese capture, which is Yeah, what's Japanese capture? That's so weird. Japanese capture is the plane crashes the Japanese capture her, and she either dies while she's imprisoned by them, or she escapes and has an assumed identity somewhere. Because this is all on the cusp of World War II, and the Japanese are active, and yes, in there's all area. kinds of subterfuge in the region. Okay. But the right. crazier theories were a bit more like ESP and using them to find her, or uh -huh. right. that she was, in, I think she was hired by the Roosevelts to spy on Japan, but it was this whole secret thing, and they couldn't talk about it. There's yeah. a movie that they made about it in the right, 1940s. Right. It's like a whole other Yeah, a lot of stuff culture. going on. Right. Okay, in Atchison, Kansas. Yeah. Right. All right, so, but Atchison being her hometown, is any of her family there? Not anymore. I believe there's some distant relatives, but her immediate family, no, they live elsewhere. But they did come in town, into town for this. While you were there, this, pa this was this... This past year, This right? past year. Yeah. Amelia's right. younger sister, Muriel, was being honored by the festival. And so they were in town to accept the award for her. Okay, so Muriel's passed away. Yes, she has. So who was there to accept the award? So Muriel's daughter, Amy Kleppner, was there. Amy's 87 years old. And her family came along to, to honor Muriel. So her sons, Bram and Caleb, and their wives and children. Okay. All right. And so now, Amy's 87. Did she ever meet Amelia? She did. She did, but she met her when she was very, very young, like mm -hmm. four or five years old. And when we talked to her about it, you know, she said her memories of her were very hazy. It was, you know, I went on a car ride with my aunt, but mm -hmm. it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And she talked to me about flying or, you know, there wasn't yeah. anything very specific. Right. It was not kind of what you're hoping. Right? Yeah, we, like, did, we she... didn't get the like heartwarming. And then right. I knew, you yeah, know, right, right. Sort of. Does she look like Amelia? I mean, do you see her and see any kind of sort of I only, resemblance? Only because I know they're related. You know, mm -hmm. she has, mm -hmm. she's slim the way Amelia is, and she has short hair, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. if Amy Kleppner were walking down the street, I don't think I'd be like, oh, yeah, she totally is related to Amelia Earhart. Right, okay. But now, okay, so you meet the family, and, like, where did, how, did you, how did you meet them? Where did you meet them? So we wanted to get together with the family, and we met them at the, um, the Birthplace Museum, which is where Amelia Earhart was born. It was originally her grandparents' house. It's in Atchison. Mm -hmm. It's this beautiful gingerbread house that like sits on this bluff overlooking the Missouri River. It's so idyllic and beautiful. Um, so we went, we went to go meet them there. But while we were walking around town, before we had met them there, all of the people we talked to about theories, well, not all, many, 
or would kind of take you aside and say, like, has anybody talked to you about the basement? You should really try to get in the basement. Wait a minute, the basement of the house? The basement of the house. You know, you'd say, oh, we're here from National Geographic, and they'd be like, oh, that's great. Oh, but you should check out the basement. This sounds totally creepy. It was, and they this wouldn't like... say why. So we were like, oh, okay, we'll check out the basement. So we were lucky enough that when the family was there, that they were able to go downstairs with us. So we're there with Amy Kleppner and Bram and Caleb and the grandkids, and we go in this back door to get into the basement, and it's kind of dark and cluttered, and they have like Christmas decorations in there because they throw events at that place. But as you walk through this isn't back, part of the museum. Then. No, this no, is it's off track, off limits. You are okay. not allowed unless you know the director of the museum says you can go there. So you walk back in, and then it's this concrete room, and it's this room under the house. It's an old-fashioned basement. It's dark, and there are these two weird concrete lumps in the back like up against the wall, about as tall as me. I'm not very tall. And like maybe five feet long. So we're gonna in this we're gonna play a clip of so us. So you had down you there. guys had you had audio down there and we your... had audio down there and you're gonna hear Bram Kleppner and you're also gonna hear the chairwoman of the museum talking about what they're describing what they see and they're describing kind of a strange theory about the disappearance. So there are lots of people who have lots of theories about what happened to Amelia, and some are more coherent than others. But there are, in fact, people who think that she took on another identity and lived a secret life, and, you know, I've never heard anyone give a coherent explanation of how if she did that and died somewhere, her body was then brought in here and encased in these large bits of cement. But, you know, people incline towards conspiracy um, thrive on uncertainty. And the fact that no one can sort of say, why are these two big lumps of cement here, feeds perfectly into what they're inclined to believe, right? So, but uh, I do know there are people who think that that's Amelia and that's Noonan. That's what people th some people think, right? Yeah. That they were like under here. Yeah. Entombed. Actually, a guy who, who wrote a book, his name is David Horner, he paid a lot of money to have them uh, x-rayed. Yeah. He said it was inconclusive. <laughs> <laughs> so, which, which is like the best outcome he could have hoped for, <laughs> yes, right? I know. But I missed the beginning. What, what? some people believe that Amelia and Fred are like buried under these lumps of stone. Oh, OK. You Mysterious know. big cement things in the basement of the Birthplace Museum. What she else could it be? I, lo I love how the great nieces are like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what? Whatever. What's going on with this? So Bram pulled me aside later, and he told me the full theory, and it, as he understands it. So in this theory, Amelia's captured by the Japanese. And she's being held. It's during, and you know, it's right. held through World War II. Right. So Douglas MacArthur, General Douglas, General Mac Douglas MacArthur, smug, is able to, like, at the end of the war, smuggle her out. Right. Dressed as a nun, a Amelia, not MacArthur, and then <laughs> she somehow comes That'd back. That'd be a hell of a theory. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It's okay. I'm totally laughing. So, um, so she lives. She she's able to come back to the states. And she lives out her life as a New Jersey housewife. And then it's a little fuzzy on the how they get to the basement and are buried there. Right. But they get to the basement and they're buried there. You know, this, it, we're all laughing. And it is, you know, amusing. And, you know, you kind of wonder how these things, I mean, it happens in our culture. But at the same time, you know, you're with the family members of this real person. They knew Amelia or they, you know, Amy Kleppner knows Amelia as a, as a, as her aunt, right? And, how did the how does the family process the, the zany part of this? The the people that are, that are coming up with all this all these all these crazy theories. I think generationally it it was different. You know, Bram and Caleb and the grandkids seemed to be more at ease with it, and you know to have some fun with it. Also, they were more open to you know talking about her legacy and talking about how the mystery sort of keeps that alive, and they see that as a, I think sometimes a positive. Um, but Amy Kleppner had a had a different a different take on it completely. I mean, she's when you meet her, she's 
strong and steely, doesn't suffer fools. I mean, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's a really accomplished woman herself. You know, she got a PhD from, um, in philosophy from Columbia, one of the first women to do it. She kayaked the entire Connecticut River on her wow. 78th birthday. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. She, she's the real deal. That's definitely Amelia Earhart's yeah. niece, right? Yeah. Totally. See, when you asked before if I would say she was related, the looks, no, but the deeds, yes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So I think when she talks about Amelia Earhart, she recalls growing up in the shadow of her aunt and the shadow of that disappearance. And she remembers that a lot of the, the conspiracy theories and the searchers caused her mother real pain. Uh -huh. I mean, right. not only for claiming that you know her, she was executed by the Japanese, but also by bringing it up yeah. over and just right. not letting it go. Right. Right. You know, she knew about our upcoming expedition, and you know, we talked to her about it, um, and she told us a few things that you know that made us call into question, you know, why we were searching. So let's listen to that. Yep. Uh, not in my view. I don't believe one penny should be spent in that particular way. There's a lot of misery in the world that can be alleviated by those millions of dollars that have been spent on searching the ocean and digging up graves in various islands and, and uh, all the rest of it. Yeah, totally no nonsense. Mm -hmm. yeah. She definitely sounds tough. Well, okay, so... How did you process, so you spent this time looking at Atchison and all its manifestations. What, what, did, what, did, you, what did you come away with? I think more questions than answers, really. You know, there's, you guys heard it in the montage um, of people saying, we don't want her to be found, we don't want her to be found, uh -huh. which was surprising. Some of that, I think, was maybe people will stop talking about Amelia and all the great things that she did. If the mystery is solved, huh. they'll lose interest. Right. Um, some people, I think, really enjoy the search. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The mystery adds some wonder to the world, and maybe there's some things that we're not meant to know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think one of the big questions was, how does motivation play into it? Is it about Amelia and celebrating her, or is it about the glory of solving the mystery? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So I know we all felt unsettled after hearing the, the family's opinion and seeing how much more complicated the story really is. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we decided to keep searching anyway, right? Yes, we did. We did. <laughs> I'm really hoping that Amy Klepper didn't hear about the business class tickets for the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, if she didn't, <laughs> she has now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, we have a good reason for, for doing this search, though. I mean, we really think that this is, this is not, uh, this is, there's a lot, of, a lot of things going on here that, that give us um, reason to think that Nicomaroro might be the place that she ended up. Where does this theory originally come from? So the theory comes from, from TIGAR, which is the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery. Okay. Um, they're run by Rick Gillespie, who is their executive director, and Pat Thrasher, his wife, and she's also the president. They run TIGAR out of their home in Pennsylvania. Um, and Tigar is basically a, a group of experts, so archaeologists and aviation experts, mm -hmm. um, volunteers, citizen scientists, and they all get together and look for lost planes. So Amelia Earhart is their biggest mystery. Their biggest mystery that they they. Uh, so they're not just on. looking for her. They're looking for they're planes looking and all, all over the place. Glenn Miller, you know. Oh, interesting. Yeah, huh. yeah. So they are. It, not only are they, you know, doing academic research and publishing papers and, you know, poking holes in each other's theories, they go on expeditions. They've been to the island 12 times. They've been to Niku 12 times. Okay. And um, they also sing. And they sing. They sing. Okay. We have a lot of downtime on expeditions. And they're, you know, they're either on a boat or you can't dig all day. And some of the ways that they entertain themselves is they make up songs about Amelia. Okay, well, we'll get to that in a minute all here. Right. But, they, <laughs> but there definitely is this enthusiasm. But at the same time, we just have to say these, these are, are pretty legitimate. Like they're rigorous in their, in their testing their theories. They're not just kind of off on, on, on nutty tangents. No, they're not on. Yeah. So if you talk to Rick Gillespie, he will say like he sees abundant, quote unquote, conclusive proof that she's, she died on Niku. Okay, and why, what does he see? Why does he say that? There are kind of three big clues, if you will, mm -hmm. that they use to support their theory. The first one is 
what Amelia said during her final transmissions. So you talked about how Fred was navigating before. Right. And now that the, his method of navigation would help you approximate where you are east-west, but not really north-south. So they knew they were running low on fuel, and they knew they needed a plan B. They were looking for Howland. They couldn't find it. So okay. she tells the Coast Guard that she's flying on this line of position, 157 to 337, running north and south. So if you guys are looking at the map, it's that purple dotted line. You can see it kind of runs over Howland Island. So if you go north, there's no land. You probably, I think, will hit Siberia before you hit anything else. Mm -hmm. But if you go south, you go to the Phoenix Islands. And if that line gets extended all the way down through the Phoenix Islands, it'll hit Gardner Island, which is what Nicomororo was called back then. So Tiger believes that they went south. You know, Amelia's an experienced pilot. They have maps, they have charts, that that's the decision that makes the most sense. So, so just, just so I get this clear in my head, they are... They can't find it, and they figure if they stay on this line and go back and forth just and try to stay right on it, they're bound to hit. They're bound to hit it. Hit, hit land, and especially if they're going south, right, mm -hmm. like you said. Yep. They would have been familiar with the other topography and the, the other islands what around was in What was in the area, got yeah. It. Okay, got it. Okay, so. So then there are the radio signals. So Niku is surrounded by a coral reef, and it... Tiger, Tiger believes that the plane landed on top of this reef. Radio signals from Amelia were heard hours after she went missing. So basically these messages, you know, calling for help on a frequency that only Amelia Earhart was supposed to use. So for order in, the, in order for those messages to go out, the engine had to be dry because the engines had to run to power the radio to make the messages. So if they're in the water, the engines can't run. So the plane's either in the air or on the ground. Okay. So the signals, they come from, they, we, they believe they come from land. Um, and the U.S. Navy triangulated the signals by, heard by Pan Am stations and coast guards around the area in the Pacific. Okay. And so they triangulate them to that area. The area around Niku. Around okay. Niku. Mm -hmm. And then the third reason is also radio signals. So people around the world heard Amelia calling for help. One of them was a 15-year-old girl named Betty Clank in Florida. We should say claimed, just claimed. the fact checkers in the yes, audience thank would you. be like. Thank yes. you, fact checkers. Yes. Keep us honest. That's right. <laughs> so Betty Clank was an amateur radio enthusiast, and she had a big souped up radio. And she, as our hobby, like many people at the time, would turn on a radio and see what you could hear. So shortwave radio signals can sometimes go incredible distances. They bounce off the ionosphere and can go all over the world. So people in Toronto, in Kentucky, and Betty in Florida claim to have heard messages from Amelia. So the story goes in 1937, Betty's listening on the radio. She has her notebook with her. It's a little, little diary where she like doodles movie stars and writes down song lyrics, and she starts to hear this call for help. She begins to write down what she hears in this transmission. When we met with Rick Gillespie, he showed us the notebook, he has it in his collection, and you'll hear on this next bit of tape, he and I reading the message. So let's take a listen. And here it starts. Oh, wow. SOS, stop, Amelia, speak. Is that uncle? Un uncle, and I think it should be ankle. Mm. You know, oh, ouch, ouch, yeah, I, I think she had hurt her ankle. Help, help me quick. Help me quick. I can feel it. Oh, well. Send us help. Amelia, things are... Here I come. Let me out of here. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, this reads like the transcript of a modern 911 call. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's stuff that makes sense, stuff that doesn't make sense. We can't bail out. Yeah. Knee deep, over, stop, I can't make it. Something that sounded like New York. Yeah. And she's written NY, NY for yeah. New York, New York. Yeah. And it's, that's it. Okay, so wait a minute. New York, New York. What's that? That seems really weird. It does seem really weird at first. Okay, she's in the middle of the Pacific, but she's talking about New York. But she's not talking about New York. Okay. So what she's, what they believe Amelia is talking about is the SS Norwich City, which is a big shipwreck that uh, wrecked on the reef around Niku in 1929. 
and that wreck is visible from the shore. So it would have been there when she cre landed there. Yeah, okay. when she landed there. And in order to, I think, bring you know bring help to the island, she's giving them a landmark. Yeah. It's where the Norwich City is. Yeah. But Betty Clank doesn't know the Norwich City any more than I know the Norwich right, City. Right, but she right. knows New York City. Yeah, right. She And she just interprets it. She just she interprets it. hears it and thinks that that's what it is. Yes. So, I mean, this is trippy. Like, you're listening to your ham radio, a teenager in 1937 in Florida, and you hear this world-famous aviator calling for help. I mean, that just sounds like, like, there's, like, how do you... Tell somebody, like, you got to feel compelled to tell somebody. She did. She did tell people. She, you know, she told her parents. She told whoever would listen. And yeah. I think because of her age, she wasn't listened to. Uh -huh. But she would tell, she told the story over and over uh -huh. throughout her life. Right. And she and Rick managed to connect and she donated her library or her diary to Tigar. Interesting. Interesting. The, um, so, that just sort of raises the question, when they were doing, the, you know, the Navy was conducting this big search for her, we heard about that. It was, she was so famous and people wanted to find her mm -hmm. and were motivated. And the Navy's looking, did anybody actually make it to Nikumaroro? So the, the U.S. Navy did fly over Niku, I think. During the, during during the, the search, okay. it was one of the first places that they went. Um, but they didn't see, you know, nobody came out on the beach and, like, waved at them or anything. Mm -hmm. They did note that they saw signs of recent habitation, but I don't think it looked like anything significant enough to warrant landing and searching mm -hmm. the island. Mm -hmm. You know, they believed it could have been Pacific Islanders. They, mm -hmm. You know, they weren't mm -hmm. necessarily sure it was it's a It's not like they saw a plane and thought, there yeah, she is, right? they didn't see a plane. They didn't see, like, help spelled out on the beach or anything uh -huh, like that. Uh -huh. You know, nothing right, like that. Right, right, right. And so... Um, you know, since then, I guess Tigar has been to the island. So what have they? Times. Oh, Twelve times. Twelve wow. times. Okay, so why do they keep going back? Have they found anything? I mean, what makes them keep focusing on this island? I mean, they they believe in the the radio signals. They believe in that evidence, but they've also found um, some artifacts when they've gone. And they there's one particular spot on the island where they found remnants of a of a campsite. Okay. Um, they found. You know, charcoal and fish bones, and but they've also found artifacts from the era. So a zipper, an, an American zipper pole. They found rouge. They found fragments from a compact. They've also found a jar of what they believe is freckle cream. Okay, and why would that be? You know, uh, this is the piece that lots of people focus on: freckle cream. What? Okay, first of all, what is freckle cream? Okay, so freckle cream doesn't give you freckles, it okay. takes them away. Okay. So right. apparently Amelia Earhart had freckles and didn't like them. And so there were, you know, cosmetic creams that you could buy that would that would fade them and basically bleach your skin. Okay. And so she's she's Amelia Earhart. She's a celebrity at this point in time. She's conscious of her image. Mm -hmm. She knows when she gets off a plane, people are gonna be taking her picture. Right. So she would have traveled it's likely that she would have traveled with cosmetics. Uh -huh. So the freckle cream jar, I believe, is the clear glass one that's kind of in the middle. Okay, all right. Now, but, okay, so you got these things there. None of them, you know, are tied direct. It's not like her initials are engraved. It's not like her initials are on it. And also, the island was inhabited after she disappeared. The, the British had a coconut plantation colony there. So Small one, though, Small right? one, though. Yeah, okay. Mostly, inhabited mostly by men, but... Those artifacts could have gotten there in other ways, and Tigar admits that. You know, they will say that the, archeo the archaeological evidence is the weakest, but to me, I don't know. I feel like it's the most tactile. You can look at it and imagine somebody right, right. with that busted pocket knife on a desert island in a way that maybe radio signals feel more abstract. Now, now I'm just noticing the picture here. There's a big piece of metal. What is, what is that? That they believe is a piece of the plane. That's aluminum. But they don't know for sure. They don't know for sure. So this is basically the collection here that we're looking at. Yes. It's a small, tiny collection. Yes. Right. And they found other things on the island that they've since, you know, ruled out as not Amelia things. So they are, they don't, you know, they don't just find something on the island and go, oh, this must be Amelia's. Like, they're, right. they're pretty rigorous So there's, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence here. We have yes. artifacts that may or may not belong to her. We have these radio signals, which seem to be pretty... And then we have this, this distress call, 
nothing we can super pin down, but enough to make us really, really curious, right? Enough to make us curious and enough to send us out to look. Okay. All right. Well, we're about to go out to look. Um, but before we do that, let's hear one of those Tigar songs. <laughs> Off we go, seeking Amelia Earhart. Come along, it'll be fun. Waste your days listening to lies from old farts. Sail away, die in the sun. <laughs> Down we dive, searching the reef for plain parts. Up with none, hell of a bore. We'll blame Japan, she's on Saipan, or maybe that's her now at the front door. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to bring out two people that actually went on the expedition this summer to Nikamaroa. Please welcome to the stage Rachel Shea and Kristen Clark. <laughs> you guys have super fans here. <laughs> okay, so we're going to pick up the story at sea, and first... I want to introduce formally. Uh, so Rachel Shea is a writer and editor at National Geographic, and she wrote some stories from the expedition this, mm -hmm. this summer. And Kristen Clark is one of our senior producers for Overheard, and we sent her with a microphone. So the two of you guys went with, out with the whole crew to the place that we were just talking about, right? All right, so Rachel, let's start with you. So what was it like to be out in the ocean with Bob Ballard. I mean, he's an iconic figure, right? I mean, what was that like? It was great once I stopped throwing up. It was great. So. <laughs> Did Bob throw up? I'm no, guessing no. No, right? he had a theory that if you kept your stomach full, you wouldn't get sick, and he didn't get sick. That's an interesting theory. <laughs> he's got a lot of experience. <laughs> right. Okay, so I, we know about Bob Ballard from the Titanic. I mean, that's his headline event, mm -hmm. but he's not just a one... Oh, you know, he hasn't just done one big right. thing. He's, he's got kind of a longer career. Right. right. I mean, he found John F. Kennedy Jr.'s, or not Jr., John F. Kennedy's um, patrol boat from, the world, from World War II, another right. small thing in the Pacific. He found the German battleship uh, Bismarck. He's found um, smoking, black smoker vents, you know, an important scientific discovery. What is that? Black, I don't know what that is. Black it, smoker vent. Yeah, you're, you're tricking me up with your science. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, these are... Um, underwater vents that spew out all sorts of black smoke, and there's all sorts of um, unexpected life around it that people didn't know about. Yeah, so he's kind of... He, he's I mean, a, he's, he's a the real deal. He's yeah. a geologist, yeah. and he's an oceanographer, yeah. Okay, so now, what was his plan for going after this? Because this is really a tricky thing. I mean, the Bismarck mm -hmm. and the Titanic are mm -hmm. massive, you know, ships made out mm -hmm. of steel, right? I mean, and... This is a, a plane made out of aluminum, which is, right. you know, super, a lot less durable than, than a battleship, right? Yeah. He called his plan mowing the lawn. He would use uh, the Nautilus, which had multi-beam sonar and side scan sonar and two ROVs and a bunch of drones, and he would just sort of snake around the island, mapping as he went, and then dropping um, ROVs down to use these high-definition cameras where you could get these amazing shots of octopus and sharks and planes if they had them. <laughs> but, wow. <laughs> okay, so he was pretty confident going in. I mean, would you say? I mean, uh... He said that if he didn't find it in 48 hours, it wasn't there. Wow. Yeah. That's a bold statement right there. He's a bold man. It's 82 <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't we take a listen at, at Bob sort of describing his own, his own theory about this. When you set in a search strategy, it's a grid pattern, and you stick to it, and it's methodical. It's just methodical, and you do not leave a single stone unturned. And that's what we're going. We're going in there clinical. We're doing surgery like a brain surgeon. You don't just wander around in a person's brain. Okay, so we're going in there with extreme discipline. And that is what I have. I've come from military training or whatever. 
or 60 years of doing it, you just methodically beat it to death. So I know exactly what I'm going to do. And either I'm going to hit pay dirt in the first two days or not. This is, it's either going to be a slam dunk or forget it. Does anybody else have Bob Bauer like swimming around in their brain right now <laughs> <laughs> doing surgery? He has that power. Yeah, yeah it seems like it. It yeah. seems like it. Okay, so you're on his boat, the Nautilus, mm -hmm. and is this, this, I mean, it sounds like this is a pretty, pretty large vessel, right? Yeah, it's a pr pretty large vessel, has a pretty big crew, very um, professional scientific crew, and I mean, he basically, he had a plan and he executed it. Uh, he had his scientific crew on four hour, 24 seven watches. So they were all up in the control van looking at this just mass of screens, right. looking for tiny bits of aluminum plane yeah. among all this coral. So he's going around and you, you, you're saying that he, he's mapping this. So what's the terrain like around the island? Like, is this, I mean, I kind of imagine like there, there's the plane that's on this nice sandy bottom. <laughs> You know, there's fish swimming around it. Yeah, not exactly. Not that. No. Um, Nicomoro is a, is a tiny island on top of a giant mountain, basically. So the beautiful little atoll, and then down below it's Everest with crevasses and cliffs and lots of ways for a plane to just get pulverized by the reef. So this is actually the Norwich City, I guess, what's left of it. Yeah, that right? yeah, that was a ship that ran aground, I think, in 1929, and there's very little left of it. We did see a lot of wreckage from the Norwich City underwater. And how did that, like, so if you're underwater looking at that, I mean, is there like a debris field? Like, how, did yeah, that there's come? a debris field, and Bob really used that to figure out what, um, how the plane would go down the slope. And the, but the Norwich City's material is much heavier than the plane. So what he was really looking for from the plane was the engines, because he figured the engines could roll down the slope and not get as battered. Right, because they're the made out of heavier material. I yeah, guess, right? yeah. Okay, so 48 hours, he's got this bold prediction out there. What did you guys find in 48 hours? Hats. We found two hats underwater. Wait a minute, hats? Hats. Um, like Amelia Earhart's hat. No. And Fred, <laughs> no. Fred and Amelia's hat. No, that would have been awesome with the leather flaps yeah. and the goggles and everything. No, we found a hat from the navigator of the Nautilus. Who, <laughs> the ship you're on, actually. The ship we're on. <laughs> yes, it blew off um, the navigator's head, and then they spotted it in the water and picked it, whoops, sorry, picked it up with the little grabbers from Hercules, put it in the little box and brought it back up and they pulled it out and it was sopping wet and he put it on his head and went about his business. <laughs> so. But I, you know, we laugh and that, that is, you know, it's, but at the same time, I think if you're able to find, you know, a small cotton right. pad in deep water and yeah. see what it is and all that, I mean, it's. Yeah, the tools were there to find small things. It's just, we found different small things than what we were looking for. Okay, so that's the first 48 hours at sea, mm -hmm. and now we're gonna switch over to the land team, and that was, that was, that was the team that, that you were like, that you were with, uh, Kristen. So what's that like? So what's the island itself like? Well, let me see. I think, uh, you know, I, uh, I wanna tell you, I, I think the best person to take you to the island is actually Dr. Tom King. Um, he's the archaeologist that's been heading up the land effort, the archaeology effort with Tiger for years and years, and has been to the island a bunch of times. And he has this really special connection with the island, so, um, so I want to play that. Amy, Amy and Tom talked about that before they left on the expedition. Okay. okay. I've never sat down and tried to figure out what it is. Uh, it's just, if I can go back, I do. Now, I think this will be my last trip. I'm getting really pretty old and, and weak for this kind of thing. But um, I'll regret that it's my last trip. Looking back on it from the standpoint of it being your last, what was the first hook that got you? The island. The, um, just the, the spirit, if you will, of the island. You come ashore through this channel that was blasted through the reef in 1963 when the colony was abandoned and the people were taken out. 
you come ashore and then you hack your way through the feral coconut and pandanus across to, to the lagoon side along what we now call the Gallagher Highway. There's no highway there, but we just hack a trail out to what we call the Club Fred Beach on the lagoon. And that first time coming out through the bush and seeing the lagoon there in front of me with the little shark fins crisscrossing the lagoon and the buka trees on the other side of the lagoon all sort of golden in the sun and the white kia kia birds the terns flying over the over the trees i could have stood there for hours This place sounds amazing. It sounds beautiful. I mean, idyllic. I mean, it's like almost like a sort of a vacation spot, for at least for Tom. <laughs> yeah, Tom. So Tom describes this really, really romantically. I'm going to tell you some things that are a little less romantic about the island. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, every morning we cram into these big lifeboats. We cram those dogs in there, and then the goal, when you know, Tom is talking about this blasted channel, it is this jagged, sharp channel, um, and you have to get past. You have to get past it into the island, and meanwhile, the tide is just sucking you out. And if you fall out of the boat, it will rip you out to sea, and then like down under the water. <laughs> it's like really treacherous, and like the sea is so strong out there that you actually see these giant uh, slabs of coral that have just been like thrown up onto the shore from the ocean. So uh, it's a little bit dicey getting in and out of the boat, and then you have to get the dogs up there. Um, let me see. The, the, <laughs> it's uh, that lagoon that he was describing. It is uh, absolutely this beautiful powder blue because it is completely full of bird poop. <laughs> Uh, so you were trudging through that all day. It is, and we're, we're dressed head to toe to keep covered up from the sun because it is devilishly hot because it is the equator in August. Um, and, um, you know, and then on top of that, the island just eats everything that it touches alive. Um, basically, it's it, like there's rotting coconut everywhere and these coconut crabs are there and they basically everything just gets like pulled apart and picked apart by these giant coconut crabs that are all over um, and then not to mention it you're like three days away from every land every other piece of land out there um, so it's totally isolating it's a little bit terrifying and you know you think about dying alone there which is really kind of what we're looking at on the yeah, island right. it's actually a little sinister yeah I can imagine so Tom has been there several times now. Why do you think he keeps going back? Uh, I mean, you can sort of hear in his voice, he's got a connection there. And what's, what's going on there? What's it's, going a, on? it's a serious connection. Tom is a little bit of a paradox to me. Um, he is, first of all, he's a really serious archaeology, super well respected. Right. Um, the, the kind of the thing that he's known best for is he does a lot of work to make sure that archaeologists working on dig sites are protecting the cultural heritage of um, different indigenous groups and making sure that their kind of values and are, are respected. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really cool stuff. And he's but he's retired now, and so this is his project. Mm -hmm. And this project is very different. Um, he describes it in these really soulful, passionate, almost poetic terms. And um, man, I mean, so just to kind of give you a sense of how deep that connection goes, he's mm -hmm. written a couple of fictional novels about Amelia on the island that kind of tie together all of the different evidence that Tiger has found into kind of one coherent narrative. But this is fiction. This, this is, is like a... it's, it's fiction. He's, okay. he's basically kind of connecting the dots in a little constellation of okay. all of the evidence. Right. Um, but what that takes is it actually means that he kind of, to write the novel, put himself in Amelia's shoes, yeah. imagined that she crashed on the airplane, it vividly imagines her dying on the island. Wow. Um, and like to kind of take this one step further, one of the main theories that Tiger is kind of exploring on this island is the idea that if Amelia and, cra uh, Amelia and Fred crash landed there, right. um, it, their bodies might have gotten like picked apart by these coconut crabs and kind of taken down into little like crabby hidey holes. Right. Um, 
And, I mean, that's not a crazy theory. It's, it's not a crazy. No, it's yeah. a very, it's a legit serious theory. Right. Um, and they've been able to, and yeah, it's it's actually one of the more likely theories, actually, because huh. you, you leave your lunch out on this island and immediately it's covered in crabs. Wow. So, um, but, but to kind of give you a sense of this for Tom, Tom... Tom's son is a lawyer, and he had his son draft a will for him so that if he dies, if he died on this expedition, which was something that was like a possibility for him right. in his mind, um, if he died on the island, they, he wanted them to leave his body there so that it could be an experiment so the scientists could understand better how a body decomposes on the island and gets picked apart by coconut crabs. That's total commitment right there. It's really intense, right? <laughs> so, yeah, but... Uh, We're yeah. not all in that far in. That's, no. that's a whole other level. No. Right? No, that's, that's Even next Fred level. wouldn't go that yeah. far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so, but over to the serious work of archaeology. So you've got these dogs. You've got, you know, the state-of-the-art archaeological tools yeah. in this place that we think, you know, has some possibility of yielding. <laughs> so, yeah, so tell us about, tell us about the work, you know, on the island. Yeah, so, okay, so there are, there are the dogs. They're really cute. There are two border collies. Their names are Berkeley and Ruby. That's Berkeley there in the hole. Um, <laughs> and, yes, they are very serious scientific tools. They are trained to alert. They're trained to lie down on the spot where they smell uh, the scent of decomposed human bone, which they, they can tell the difference between decomposed animal bone and live humans. Um, so it's really amazing. And the reason that these dogs are so important is because of the place that we're working. So Nicomaroro is a coral atoll, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that means that basically all of the land on the island, as you can see there, is made up of the coral reef except smashed apart into billions and billions and billions of teeny tiny pieces and bleached by the sun. Uh, those teeny tiny pieces happen to look nearly identical to human bone. So <laughs> I, I can't put too fine a point on this. We are right. on an island that is five miles long, made up entirely, when we're looking for bone on this island, on an island made up entirely of bone imitating material. <laughs> it's like a sadist invented in archaeology. <laughs> okay, so how did that go? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I mean, it's it's pretty backbreaking work just to begin with, but I mean, all archaeology is backbreaking right, work. Right, right. Um, the trick is that uh, the equator in August is probably not an ideal place for like furry animals to be working. Right, um, right. So first of all, it's, you know, their accuracy goes way down um, when the ground temperatures go up. Um, they're not really supposed to work when the ground temperatures get over about 110 degrees, and on Nicomaruro, by about like, like 11 in the morning, the ground temperature is like 110 degrees. So that's the first trick. And then they're also, it's a totally new environment for them, so it's super hard to keep them focused. Um, and so we had one dog that was alerting in a bunch of places, and we had another dog that was barely alerting at all, and so we're trying to figure out what to make of that. Um, and then the other really interesting thing about uh, forensic dogs is that they are, they are incredibly highly trained, and they are super attuned to their handlers um, who work with them. And so the trick is, you're on this island, you've got a bunch of archaeologists that really, really, really want to find bone in this one place. And the dogs are paying attention, and so the handlers have to be really, really careful because they have to make sure that they're not actually telegraphing to the dogs right. where they want the dogs to, to, to look or alert. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so anyway, that's tricky. Um, it was a little bit hard to figure out exactly where to dig, but we had some good spots that were a little bit more likely than others. And, and that was just like really, really back-breaking hard work. They weren't finding much. And then, you know, we kept getting these messages from the, from the C team that they weren't really finding much either, yeah. which was, you know, tricky. Okay, so it's not really a spoiler to say we didn't find her. I mean, you guys would have heard about it, right? <laughs> but it's interesting. So you guys are struggling. I mean, Bob's 48 hours passes. Mm -hmm. You guys, it's really hard going on land, but okay, so after, back on, on, the, on the ship, how does Bow, I mean, Bow's not a guy that gives up easily, yeah. so how does he shift gears and what, what does he do next? Uh, yeah, he's definitely not a romantic and he's not somebody who's going to just say, ah, not there. Yeah. He, you could really, I could really see the gears working in his mind. He's trying to solve this puzzle of, okay, the, sh the plane is not where I thought it would be. It's mm -hmm. not next to, you know, 
north of the Norwich City. I'm going to look on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know, and everybody on the ship was speculating. There were a couple of pilots on board, and mm -hmm. they said, well, I wouldn't have landed on the reef if I was Earhart. I mm -hmm. would have landed in the lagoon, mm -hmm. which, of course, we couldn't get the Nautilus into the lagoon. So we didn't try to search there. Right. Um, there was, we went around the island again just to make sure, just so Bob could be sure that we covered every inch of ground. Yeah. And then we started to wonder, well, maybe she, we should go north. Maybe we should go up to McKean Island, which is closer to Howland Island, where she was aiming for. And then, um, fine, ultimately, he decided to um, follow one of the theories that the land team had come up with, which was, you know, here's this plane. It has these big tanks that are mostly empty. Maybe the tanks would make, help the plane float. So instead of getting bashed to bits on the reef, it would float out to sea and gradually glide to the, glide to the bottom. So we went out there, did some more multi-beam sonar work. So you guys made a thorough, like lots yes. of theories, lots yes. of area. I that, mean, that island is very well mapped now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So at this point, I know you talked to Bob about yeah. how he was feeling, and we're going to hear a little bit yeah. of tape about that. Uh, it's like I, I tell my wife that I... I, I go off on these great crusades and and I come home and I pull up the drawbridge and I lick my wounds and pull the darts out of my arms and, and charge my battery and then add it again. And so, yeah, I mean, you just finished a hard, grinding campaign that wasn't perhaps everything you would hope for, but boy, did we push new frontiers. Boy, did we learn a lot. So I'll go back and I'll go back to my castle, pull up the drawbridge, and sit there and decompress and then see what's there. Where's the, how's the fire going in the belly? Is it still there? It always has been. I'm sure it will be. Okay, so the land team gets wind of what's going on at sea that, you know, Ballard's searching all these other areas, still not finding anything. You know, how does that, what are, what are people thinking on land? You know, they were getting a little bit quieter, I think, as the couple weeks on the island passed. Um, but, you know, they're kind of funny, because Tiger, uh, a couple of the people that were there were affiliated with Tiger and had been back a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And Tiger has this long-standing tradition, apparently, of finding a really tantalizing clue on the very last day of the expedition. So they yeah. were very sure that that was going to happen. Um, and then when that didn't ultimately happen, you know, they... The, you know, they, they were kind of still going, and, and they also have this kind of, this mantra, which is that <coughs> negative data is still data, negative data is still data. And what does that mean, negative data? What is negative data? It basically means, um, you know, and, you know, Bob Ballard actually has the right. same thing, which is kind of like, well, we know where she isn't, um, which is Which, which is, is important, useful. right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Cross it off the list. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so, you, yeah, you can, you can eliminate options. You can say, okay, she's not there. The thing that's a little bit tricky about Niku is that, like, it's actually... You know, even if she was there, it would be really hard to find her for all the reasons, all the, the crabs and the storms and the everything. Um, and, you know, if she wasn't there, like, there's just, there's no way to prove that she wasn't. Uh -huh. There's no way to right. really know for sure. Right. And that's, it's, it kind of puts you in a weird space because you, you can't really disprove it. And so yeah. that kind of by itself is kind of enough to keep you going. Um, but... There were, there was something that probably did bother the land team a fair amount, which is that, you know, obviously the stakes of this expedition were really, really high. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? The stakes? Well, you know, so there's a ton of media coverage, like Nat Geo already, like it's a super high profile thing. Right. There's a huge TV channel. There are two boats, right. you know, there right. are very right. cute dogs. There's all this, you know, so there's yeah. a lot of attention on this. Yeah. Um, right. And, you know, and there are a whole bunch of people all around the world that are, you know, kind of waiting to hear, okay, once and for all, you know, was right. she there or was she not? Are we going right. to find her? Are we not going to find her? And, you know, and then on top of that, you know, especially for Tom, you know, this was maybe the end of the road for him. You know, he thought this was going to be his last expedition. Um, so I was trying to understand how he was working through that um, and talk to him about all of that. Okay, and we got a little bit of tape. Let's listen to that. I'll be very interested to see how, how people react to this expedition that gets so much coverage and so much attention. Um, <laughs> Thank you. 
because that'll be the challenge for us is how do we handle the questions that we get asked. That'll be hard. How will you handle the questions you get asked after this, you mean? Yeah. What sort, what are you thinking about? Well, I'm thinking about the people who will say, well, Ballard couldn't find it, it must not be there. You guys can't find it. You've been there a zillion times and you can't find anything. She must not have landed there. And, um, you know, how do I respond to that? Well, I, I have ways, obviously, of responding to it, but they're, they all sound like excuses. And um, it's kind of hard to come up with something that's... Um, kind of hard to come up with the right singer, uh, so I got to think about that. All right, so Amy, I want to bring you back into this conversation because you've been following this for a long time, and as the editor of, of National Geographic History magazine, you look at a lot of big mysteries like this, a lot of historical stories that don't have, you know, necessarily a satisfying ending that we're that are open-ended we're still you know contemplating what how do you sort of put into perspective um what tom's saying like how, how, how does this how do we process this it's interesting to hear tom say that he needs to find the right zinger because he and i before he went on the expedition had a conversation about mysteries and solving and all of the all of the troubles that go along with it. Right. And I think we have a bit of tape of that that answers those critics. So he's got the right singer. Yeah. I think that um, every good mystery deserves not necessarily to be solved, but to be pursued. And I'm, I think it's sort of almost my obligation to give it my best shot. And if I, if we fail to solve the mystery, that's fine. If we succeed in solving the mystery, that's fine too. It's in the trying? It's in the trying, sure, sure. And that's what, uh, in a way, honors Amelia, I think. So do you think it honors Amelia, that the trying, that all of this effort you know, even though, you know, I think if Amy Kleppner was here, the, the niece, you know, she said, don't try, but, but then we have all these other people. Do you feel like the trying honors Amelia? I think it does. And I, I think it does matter uh, because of the legacy of Amelia Earhart. You know, trying and striving was a big part of who she was and why she did what she did. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a quote from her memoir called, for which is called For the Fun of It, um, explaining her, in her own words why she felt drawn to aviation. Um, so she wrote, looking back now, I can see certain threads that drew me to aviation. There's the thread of liking all kinds of sports and games and of not being afraid to try those that some looked upon as being only for boys. There is the thread of liking to experiment and of the something inside me that has always liked to try new things. So Amelia was about the pursuit of about the striving. You know, when she decided to make her round the world flight, she very, very consciously didn't make grand pronouncements about why she was doing it. There was no agenda. Hmm. She did it for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. She did it because she enjoyed it. She did it because it taught her about herself. It taught her about the world. Um, and I think that same sort of spirit of striving is it's Bob Ballard's fire in the fire in the belly, mm, mm. and it's Fred Hebert's impossible projects. Right, right. You know, and I think that's why the mystery of Amelia is worth pursuing. Mm -hmm, it ties mm -hmm. right into her legacy. Right, right. Well, I think that's a good place to leave it. And thank you, everybody, for coming. We're gonna um, we're gonna take questions, but before we do that. Um, there's a few people that we definitely want to acknowledge. First of all, our senior producer, Janae West, is in the back in the booth, and she was absolutely integral in this. Woo! 
There she is. And our editor for this, for this show was Allison McAdam. We couldn't have done it without you, Allison. Thank you so much. I don't know where Allison is sitting. We also want to thank the National Geographic Channel um, that let us come along for the ride. Um, and please do check out Expedition Amelia. Um, it gets into a lot more details. There's a lot of rabbit holes you can go down on some of the, some of the really interesting pieces of the, of the search, et cetera. Um, and you can find that on the Nat Geo channel on Disney+. Plus. Um, and if you're not already subscribed to the podcast, please do. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. But before we move on any further, I, tonight I really want to acknowledge two people who have been absolutely integral to Overheard and his success this year. And that is our Deputy Director of Podcasts, Emily Oxenschlager. <laughs> Emily is the woman that, that's right, she deserves a long round of applause. Thank you. Emily, where are you? Where's she hiding? Emily um, helped build the team. She's really uh, been like the, the godmother of this, of this program. Is that a fair, fair way to describe it? And we're also um, uh, want to acknowledge our editor, Ibi Caputo, who is here tonight. She's usually uh, dialing in remotely from Arkansas, oh, but, but she's here with us tonight. And actually, both of these women are leaving us at the end of this season to go on to other new exciting adventures. We're really sorry to see them go, but we're really excited for the future uh, things that they're going to do and, and watching what those are. I mean, Emily's headed out to the West Coast, and Ibby is headed to Oxford, England. So great things ahead for those ladies. Please give them another round of applause. So um, I think we're going to bring Fred Hebert back up, and we're going to do um, a few questions if anybody has. I'm sure we answered everything about Amelia Earhart, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so we've got microphones, and uh, I'll point out. I see somebody right here in red in the very back. I have a question about production of your prod podcast. In a place like this, it's a controlled environment, but you had a lot of clips, for example, the Kansas kick clips, and then when you were on the island itself, when you are on the ship, how do you keep out the background noise and wind? I think <laughs> you have to answer that question. That's a good. We have uh, Janae. Janae and I actually went to Atchison with um, with Melissa Ferris and Amy and um, and you were there too. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, we it's uh, we have these really fancy shotgun microphones um, that kind of like zero in like a like a spotlight um, right on the voice. And so it's actually really cool. You can be sitting in a cafe and kind of point it at somebody and just eavesdrop on their conversation. Not that I do that, uh, <laughs> but it's really fun. Um, but I guess also some of the background noise is kind of what you want too, yes. right? Because that makes you feel like you're there, right? Yeah. I mean, is that, it's, I guess it's, it's sort of the, how do you balance the background noise with the, the ambi? as we call it, right? Totally. Well, so Janae listened to all the tape from the expedition that I brought back. And how um, much was that? I think so, we have to say oh how God. much that was. It was 100 and, uh, well, from the expedition itself, it was 150 hours. <laughs> That's commitment right <laughs> I'm there. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then we also did a whole bunch of pre-reporting and uh, simultaneous reporting. It was like 30 hours. Um, Janae did a lot of that. And, um, and uh, one of the things that we do is we kind of wander around on the island, and so Janae listened to like hours and hours of me just like wandering around on the island being like, okay, this is, and we'd record in stereo and be like, okay, this is what it sounds like when the waves are this high. This is what it sounds like, and we just wander around the entire <laughs> island doing that. So you get this kind of really immersive in-your-face audio. Next question. Let's see. How about uh, down here? So well, looking at the photos and all of the, the things we were seeing of the island, it's, it's this tiny, tiny strip of land with this giant thing of water in the middle. And so you were mentioning some of the people on the expedition were talking about, well, if I was a pilot and I was trying, you know, to land my tiny little plane in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, I'd aim for that lagoon. Has the lagoon been searched itself? Is that in the plan or is, does anyone know? I think they've dived in it, but I... 
they, I don't think they've sent down any ROVs. Um, one, the counter theory to why she didn't land in the lagoon is if she had landed in the lagoon, she wouldn't have been able to take off again. And if she landed on the reef, she didn't intend to bust up her wheel or whatever happened, but if she landed on the reef, she could take off again. So that was the counter theory. It's also, it's really gross. I mean, it looks blue, but it's full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. How about down here? Um, my question is simple. What's next? Where do you go from here? Ah. Well, um, Bob Ballard says he's got plans to go back in two years just to take his ship back, and he'll just swing by Howland Island and maybe Nicomoro. So, yeah. I don't know. Stay tuned. And the land team, like, they were very quiet on the way back to shore, but then by the time that we were back in Tuvalu, where we had taken off from, they were already talking about their next expedition to Nicomororo, so they're still doing it. Yeah. Um, they're talking about the new ways they'd strategize and what they do next time. How about right down here in front? Actually, here, you can use it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi. Um, so my dad was a navigator for Pan American, and oh. Fred Noonan was a navigator for Pan American, oh. and they, my dad flew later, um, and, but um, when those dogs go and look for DNA, are they looking for both her and for him? Do they distinguish two different kinds of DNA? Were they also looking, because we, I mean, if you're only looking for her and he's around, maybe yeah. you missed him. Well, the tricky part is there are no known relatives of Fred Noonan, so there's nobody to compare with. So maybe you, you want to... Well, that. we might have one. What? Woo! <laughs> you heard it here first. News. We're breaking news and overheard. News. Fred, you've been Fred. holding out. Where, where's NG News when we need it now? Yeah. Are you here? Yeah. yeah. No, the, the reality is that mitochondrial DNA, the DNA that's, that, that's handed down on the female side, um, is circular rather than a helix form. So in terms of preservation, ancient DNA, the mitochondrial line is our best. So if we were just looking for one of the two, we'd put all of our bet on looking for Amelia. Um, needless to say, there is a possibility that we could look for both. Um, uh, it's pretty exciting. And, uh, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm a little bit more optimistic. I haven't quite got to the end of my story yet, uh, partly because in the 21st century, um, that aha moment doesn't really happen in the field. It happens in the lab when you've got a terabyte or two terabytes of data. And uh, my entire September and October were ruined with people calling me up in the morning saying, do you know anything yet? <laughs> it still is a lot of data to analyze from that. So Fred Noonan may be back in the picture. Wow. <laughs> okay. How about uh, all the way in the very back? Peter, I'm a huge fan of the <laughs> podcast. It's, it's really terrific, Thank and you. it's perfect for National Geographic. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit Peter, about the popularity of this long form uh, storytelling, because I think everybody in this audience is obviously a podcast fan. I'm old enough to know that podcasts are not a new idea, but they seem to be more popular than ever. What are your thoughts about why that is? You know, okay, people who know me know that I can talk a long time about this subject because it's something, first of all, I'm from Georgia, so us Southerners are long winded when it comes to storytelling. <laughs> But I think, personally, my own theory about the podcast thing is they're just bringing back the dinner table conversation. I mean, I remember as a kid, uh, my grandparents, we'd have dinner with them, and my grandfather, was that was the storytelling time. And we would linger over Sunday dinner, and he would tell all kinds of crazy stories, you know. And my brothers and I, you know, would just sit wrapped, you know, about listening to his, you know, growing up on a farm, uh, you know, uh, crossing the country during the Depression, you know, and on and on. And I think everybody, you know, I, I'd imagine that in this room that other people, you know, have, a, have some more experiences. And I think what's happened with podcasts is, is that um, we're coming back to that moment where um, telling stories in the verbal form 
is, you know, is, is you know, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's being rediscovered, right? And another thing I think that's going on is, is that, you know, one place that we're finding people listening is in, in cars, right? And that is the one place that you're not supposed to be looking at your phone, right? <laughs> but you can listen. And, uh, and so I listen to a lot of stuff on road trips and things like this. And so it's, you know, so that, I think those are the two reasons, but I, I'm sure there's a lot of, was, and the other thing is there's a lot of great stories being told. I mean, I think the fact that the way that we're digging into Amelia, and I have to say that, you know, another plug for Expedition Amelia, I thought, I'd seen a lot over the years about the search for her and, and the mystery part, but the thing that I thought that the channel did a great job of, and you talked about, Amy, was what she meant at the time. You know, the fact that she was the 16th woman um, to have a pilot's license, that she was part of that generation. I think she was 24 when women got the vote, and she was part of that first generation of young women to be able to vote in, in the presidential election of the time. And, and, and to, you know, tell that part of her story is really, you know, so there, you know, I mean, it's an old story in a lot of ways, but it feels new because we're examining it in a different moment, right? So, uh, sorry, again, I, I can be long-winded on this kind of thing, but <laughs> that's your answer. Anybody else? How about right here in the middle? You may have alluded to this in one of the clips, but were there any corroborating accounts to the young girl who overheard on the shortwave radio? Is she the only one that picked up that transmission, or were there other hints that maybe other people also heard something similar? I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so there were several other accounts. The other places that I know of off the top of my head, there was a woman in Toronto. There was a person in Kentucky. Uh, but they, unlike Betty, didn't write down what they heard. So there wasn't a written record that they could refer to of what the messages were. But there were other places. I think they were mostly in North America, and I think there was one in Australia as well. And the thing, the, one of the things that we didn't talk about, though, was that I think you told me, Amy, tell them about that the woman, the, the teenager, who I forget it's Peggy, right? Betty. Betty, sorry, Betty. Um, she, she continued to hear this voice. I mean... When you, Rick Gillespie actually met her and spoke with her extensively, and she told him, I mean, this haunted her for her whole life, hearing this message of this person crying for help and being unable to help them. It was something that she carried as a burden with her. So it was, it was, it was rough. I mean, it would be like hearing a 911 call and not being able to do anything about it. And then when she gave the diary to Rick, what was the? I believe that it was, he had interviewed her, and you know she was getting on in years and wanted to make sure it was with somebody mm -hmm. or with an organization that would preserve it. Got it. Right. Okay. How about right here? How do you decide what topics to discuss on your podcast? That's a very good question. <laughs> well, I, you know, we're looking for good stories. Do you know any? <laughs> You got any ideas? Some, uh, some, some people in National Geographic, I think, think they found clues to find Atlantis. Atlantis. Well, Fred? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get on it. Well, that's got to wait in line because I'm going to go back to the pyramids first. <laughs> I had an right, interruption well, for a couple of years. Watch this space. That's a good suggestion. Is Atlantis not impossible enough for you or... <laughs> how much money would... How, what, yeah, yeah, if we get money. funded, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. How about over here, right here? Just looking at that uh, picture of the island, it's, it, it's small, but it's you know, vast enough when you're on the ground. How do you choose this spot versus mm. anywhere else? Yeah, that you know that whole island comprises of. Yeah, great question. That, that is a great question. Um, it, it it really you, one has to sample and and hope for the best. I mean, the Tiger Group has gone back for twelve different seasons. Um, they they've made maps. The environment has changed tremendously since nineteen 
um, 37. So instead of having tall forests, there's thicket everywhere. Um, I, I think you probably got the impression that, that being on the island itself today is, is impossible. I mean, just going through the bramble, I mean, we have machetes and, and mechanical machetes, and it just comes back every year after year. Uh, so, so our job is work more difficult. All we can really do is test to see through that thicket about places that might have been possible campsites. And there isn't just this one. There's campsite zero, one, two, three <laughs> possible. We don't know. But we do know that this one spot, it's called the seven site, not very creative, um, mm. it has fire camps. Mm. It has bones that were broken in a way that no native South Pacific person would have done. It had the most unbelievable set of giant clams that had been uh, taken and parted and put to catch the rain. There had been a castaway there at that particular site. And if there's any place in the mm -hmm. South Pacific that we were going to take our <clears throat> rather expensive forensic dogs, <laughs> that is the spot. Yeah. And, and Fred, wasn't one of the uh, wasn't one of the reasons that they were looking at the seven site to begin with because of the telegrams? There was from the British colony early on, right when the right when the colony was first being. Yeah, this settled. is a piece of the story we didn't get into. But yeah, there's so much of the story we didn't yeah. get into, guys. Um, there, there are tremendous stories about about, about various aspects of, as Tiger de devoted its considerable citizen science to to resolving what was going on. And one thing that they did is they found a series of uh, telegrams, confidential telegrams, from the governor of this particular island as they were thinking about creating a coconut um, plantation. And uh, as they were clearing through the thicket, uh, they found these uh, human remains. And those pointed to this particular spot which today is called the seventh spot, seventh site. So, yeah, there was there's fairly good archaeological evidence to the point where, if it wasn't labeled with Amelia Earhart, I would have said case closed. It's done. <laughs> Problem solved. Right. <laughs> but it's Amelia. <laughs> we have time for one last question. How about right here on the on the end? You spoke about the challenges with the dogs in the heat. Why did you go in August? <laughs> that is an excellent question. You with your logic. <laughs> yeah. Fred? <laughs> we love pain. <laughs> it's the hottest time. It's the most difficult time. Honestly, there's a lot to to uh, negotiate when you're trying to plan a major expedition. Um, part of it had to do with when the ship of exploration was coming through the area. But a lot really had to do with um, the cycle of storms. You really don't want to be out in the middle of the South Pacific during cyclone period. So our window of opportunity sometime between June, July, and August um, you take your pick. It's hot during any of those times. Uh, the, but that happened to be the sweet spot. And when the stars were aligned and we were able to go out there, it was really quite amazing. It was an amazing trip. Well, listen, thanks again, everybody, for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed it. Keep listening. And see you all soon.